Well, I might as well get started here. People are crawling into the meeting. So um, we will start this meeting. As you can see, I have we have officially entered my lame duck presidency presidential session. And we are going to be promoting our um, 4th of July event, right? We got hats on order. Yep. They're so here. I would like to start the meeting by introducing our guests. And Andy, could you please just do that? And then we'll have them do the, your presentation in a little bit. Muted. It would be easier for me, President Nancy, because I'm on my phone. I can't see everybody. If I could, oh, okay. If I could, well, then I can. I can look. Or just introduce President Chase and ask him to introduce the officers. Okay, good. President, interact, President Chase. I, I'm looking at you right now. You're muted, but could you please introduce your uh, your fellow interact officers? Uh, yes, ma'am. Currently, our officers are me. Owen and Jackson, and Owen is not here today, but Jackson is. And then the incoming officers consist of Sebastian Lafeu, who's not here because he's taking an AP test, Alyssa, Summer, uh, Isabel Smith, and Max Hubble. And we have Alyssa here representing the incoming officers. Wonderful. Is Alyssa a relative? Alyssa is a relative. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome everybody, and we look forward to um, the presentation here in a little bit. Um, I don't see Ted Calvert on this call. He had an interesting message, uh, a Memorial Day message that I wanted him to share with you. But in lieu of that, I pulled a couple of tributes off the internet and uh, so I'm just going to go ahead and read them. One of them is, death leaves us with heartache that no one care to cure. On the occasion of Memorial Day, let us remember all our brave departed souls. Uh, and this one reminds me of Rotary's comment about service above self. A hero is someone who has given his or her life to something bigger than oneself. And from our beloved Mark Twain, patriotism is supporting your country all the time and your government when it deserves it. <laughs> and finally, our dearly departed Maya Angelou, how important it is for us to recognize and celebrate our heroes and sheroes. So I hope you all had a nice weekend and were able to keep your special people in your hearts for those who have gone before us. I know I'm seeing my dad out on that destroyer in the Pacific Ocean. Um, okay, we were good. Dan Erickson next week will do the board of directors summary. Is that, will that work for you, Dan? Oh, he's over there busy. Anyway, we will have to hopefully have that next week. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So, I'd like to have uh, Dan and Andy talk for a minute about the bike tour that we've been working on, Giro Vignetti. Okay, well, I'll start. Um, uh, we're getting, uh, we had a, a blast out, uh, 2000 plus uh, emails. Uh, Diane sent that out and we've gotten uh, quite a few inquiries and a few signups. Uh, we'll, um, we're going to need to staff some um, uh, uh, rest stops. So coming up with locations and some uh, uh, bodies or entities to uh, do that is coming up. But uh, it seems to be coming into place pretty good. Got good sponsorships. Uh, I've got an awesome uh, jersey for sale. Uh, you can... Uh, Go online and get one of those uh, for uh, up until Sunday, I believe. And uh, 
that's all I have to say. What do you want to add, Andy? Just to remind everybody, the email should have been sent out to every club member. And uh, just hopefully everybody has had the opportunity to send that out to their personal email contact, contact list, friends, family, neighbors, whoever you know who might be a bicyclist or may not be a bicyclist. This, this ride gives uh, experts to beginners the opportunities to get out and ride. So uh, blast it out to everybody you know, and, and our numbers will keep going up. And, and just also keep in mind that this is kind of a, a, a stepping stone for what we hope to build this event in the future. So um, this is just the start of the momentum and it'll keep getting bigger every year. Is this still a multi-day event or has it become a single day event? Uh, to this year, it's just single. We started with a virtual event. We're now transitioning to a live event. And I believe it's the transition to the live event that has actually uh, generated momentum and generated the interest because we weren't getting a whole lot of signups when it was just virtual. Um, but as soon as we converted to live and Diane sent that email out, the registration started to pour in. But yeah, it, it's just a one day event for now. Do you and have it, a uh, count of how many we've we're up to, Andy? The I last think, figure I had was 28 or something. Uh, we're up to 41 as of 41 yesterday. writers as of yeah. yesterday. Great. And um, it's a live event. We're going to have um, River Rocks going to feed us or uh, feed the riders a, um, a lunch at the end. Uh, it'll be beginning and ending at the Mill District. And um, as Andy said, this is we're kind of stumbling out of the gate here uh, with the, the uh, COVID restrictions being lifted, but. Uh, the excitement seems to be building, and I think it'll be really strong in, in the future years. And we really want to uh, emphasize the uh, health and wellness aspect of this. And I think it'll be great for the club and for Healdsburg and for the riders. So uh, it's pretty cool. Anybody have any questions, comments? What's the date for this again? OK, we have. Uh, Taken over the Iron Man's date, the uh, fourth Friday, or excuse me, the fourth Saturday of July, twenty fourth. It's unfortunate that it's close after the fourth, but good things happen in July. What can I say? And Nancy. this shouldn't be as big of a. I mean, we need everybody that can help to help, but it won't be as labor intensive the day of as the um, 4th of July, right? Correct. Nancy? Yes? Can I make a comment? Absolutely. Comment uh, away. I, I mentioned this to my tenant who is, uh, he, he's an avid writer. He's written several uh, 100 and 200 mile runs. He does Iron Man. He's done, he's just very, and I mentioned it to the tenant and, uh, he said, this will be a really great opportunity for me to get my wife and kids out to ride with me because he's not this. He, they're, they're not going to be able to keep up with him on a regular ride. But on something like this, he can just take his time and enjoy it. When he gets back, they can have a meal together. And it just makes it for a good family event. So I just wanted to mention that. Yeah, that's a good point, because uh, some of the routes are geared for family rides. <laughs> right, Andy and Dan. Oh, yeah. We've got uh, 25, uh, 40, 60, 80, 100 mile rides. So it's uh, something for everybody. You can even uh, charge up to the top of Pine Flat if you're an animal. <laughs> All right. Any other questions? All right. Thanks, gentlemen. Andy, would you like to uh, to inter, inter, introduce the interact officers for the for uh, the what you had planned, what you had asked me for? Andy can describe why the interact students are here. I'm for Klempt. It would be my honor. Yes, uh, we're going to do a couple things. Basically, 
uh, to recap the Interact Club year and also to thank the officers for the uh, uh, extraordinary work that they put in this year. Um, I think the club has heard me talk about in the past that um, I did not think we were going to have an Interact Club this year because of the pandemic and being in a virtual environment uh, and me caught up in, in my work world, um, I have to admit that the Interact Club was not, the, the, not at the top of my list of things that I needed to do. But then I got a note from Nadia, who was the president at the time, the officers got together and made it happen. Um, they met on their own, they figured it out, they set up the Zoom meeting, and once they were ready to go, they, they let me know they were ready to go. So uh, right from the get-go, uh, it was a great start with the Internet Club. And yes, we started out with President Nadia. And initially, the projects, um, we, we, we have traditionally, over the last few years, uh, gathered care packages uh, for the homeless and deleted, uh, delivered them to Reach for Home. And, and that was our big project in the fall again this year. We had a great response from the community. Um, the students did a good job of, of uh, gathering items as well. So before around Thanksgiving, we delivered a significant supply of care packages to reach for home to be delivered to the homeless. And then also another project that we've been doing every year for the last few years is adopting the family through the Presence Project. And we did that again this year. And around that time, um, that was when President Nadia uh, graduated and went off to Knowles. And then President Chase took over. Uh, and President Chase uh, didn't miss a beat. Um, we had some great projects under President Chase as well, ranging from uh, the Russian River cleanup, uh, numerous days at the community garden. Um, we also gathered first aid supplies uh, for the homeless. And this was this was a new one for us because in the past we've only done one project per year for the homeless and reach for home. But President Chase took it upon himself to uh, speak to Margaret, the new executive director at Reach for Home. And, and they worked out that something that they really needed was first aid supplies. Um, so we had a great response again from the community. And we also had uh, a local doctor, Dr. Vargas, uh, contributed a, a number of supplies that he had available. Um, so uh, once again, a great uh, response from the community and we were able to deliver a significant amount of supplies to reach for home. Um, also this year, another new one, uh, I think this was President Chase and I think maybe Jackson um, organized porch visits to senior citizens. And um, maybe that's this is something that President Chase can talk more about because once again, it was something that the, the officers put together. Um, they, they planned it. They executed the plan. Um, and once again, I was caught up in my work world and I was oblivious to it and they just did it entirely on their own. Um, and then the last thing, um, this Friday, uh, we've, uh, president Chase has invited Mar uh, Margaret from reach for home to the last interact club meeting of the year. I believe it's the last one. And the club is going to present reach for home with, with two checks totaling $1,430. So once again, a, a very successful uh, Interact Club year. And um, as, as a thank you, um, the, our club and the Noon Club have uh, put together some gift certificates for the officers this year. We already gave President Nadia a gift when she went away. So uh, at the meeting on Friday, I will present President Chase, Vice President Owen, and Secretary Jackson with gift certificates to say thank you for their leadership this year. Thank you so much, Andy. Uh, as for the porch visits, that was all uh, Jackson coordinating it. And then it was just amazing going out and interacting with local members of the community. Um, I interacted with a U.S. military veteran right before Memorial Day, so it was super fitting. Um, but just thank you. It's a tremendous honor. Uh, do you have anything to say about that, Jackson? 
Uh, yeah, Chase summed it up pretty well. I, I had a great year. Um, happy to get out and and help the community in, in such a, a tough time. So I appreciate everybody and everybody's help. Yeah, nothing would have been possible, uh, just to add on that, without the help of the Rotary Noon and Sunrise Club um, and the Rotarians that were visiting our meetings. Uh, sometimes at the start, it would be more Rotarians than interact meetings, but by the end, it was back to normal. We had, you know, 20 people, 25 people out there at some of our last meetings. So it's it's great to see interact on an uptrend. Um and just everything in general. Looks like um, Max Hubble just joined the meeting. Is he, um, he's one of your uh, incoming officers, Chase? Yes, I am. Uh, he is next year's social media manager. Wow. Maybe he could help us. <laughs> I think it's a perfect fit. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about how the porch visits, uh, you know, how, how they manifested themselves, you know, and a little bit about that. I think I find that intriguing. Yeah. So Jackson came into contact with Anna Grant with the city. I'm not exactly sure how it happened. And then we had her out for an interact meeting and she kind of talked about what would happen um, and we discussed a day that would work and we found a day and I mean, she told me everybody loved it. Um, so we're going to plan another one, I think for next year's interact club. So you literally went to people's homes and just stood out there and chatted with them for what, 10 minutes. Um, it it was a lot more than 10 minutes. <laughs> um, we, in my case, I drove to this man's house and uh, Miss Grant just sent everyone an address and like a couple things about them as conversation pieces. Um, but I mean, I didn't really use those. Everything was just so natural. Um, we went to our uh, person's house and then just visited with them. In my case, for about 45 minutes, um, Alyssa was out there picking, uh, I believe carrots and stuff from her person's garden. And then Max was out there. Uh, I'm not sure what they talked about, but he told me he had a great time and it was with an author. So it was just great, great ways to interact with the community. And it's not really traditional community service. Um, but I think it was still filling a, a pretty big need in the community with COVID, a lot of these people hadn't been interacting with anyone. So it was great to kind of fill that and help out the city and help out our seniors. That's amazing. Uh, maybe we can get something in the paper about this just to let people know what you guys have done because it's, it's you know, the list that Andy just presented to us is pretty impressive. Uh, was there anything else you wanted to to talk about or in, introduce any of the other students, have them speak? Um, no, I think we're all good. Um, unless Max or Alyssa, if either of y'all have anything you'd like to say, feel free to go ahead and say it uh, about the porch visits or this year or plans for next year or anything. I'm really excited to get to know y'all and be a part of next year's Interact Club. Yeah, I'm excited too. Well, if it's anything like this year, we're excited. And we look forward to uh, supporting you next year and, and uh, having you come to our meetings as, as often as possible. And we are committed to to you guys, and and we want to hear how how your college lives go, and you have some time when you get back into town, and to, just do not be strangers because you you you're amazing young people. I get I get chills. You know, it makes me uh, very hopeful. 
Thank you for coming today. You're welcome to stay as long as you like. And, um, but I know you probably have to get off to school. So we will see you soon. Hopefully at the 4th of July, <laughs> come out and help us get on your bikes July 24th, or if you're golfers show up at the, the Drew Esquivel golf tournament in September. All right. Thanks guys. Thank you for having us. All right. So speaking of 4th of July, Lance. All right. Uh, so we are continuing to move forward on the 4th of July plans. Uh, we've got meetings uh, every Monday at 4 p.m., uh, except for uh, June 14th, uh, since that's uh, my wife's birthday. And so we're going to be doing something else that day. But other than that, it'll be every, every Monday at 4 o'clock. Uh, we've got a lot of people already stepping up and getting very active. We've got the popcorn and snow cone machines rented and, you know, plans for the street corn that we're going to make, which is a new addition this year. Uh, hot dogs are getting the, the pricing together. So the budget starting to coalesce. Uh, Doug jumped in and sent out the fundraising uh, letters to all the people who've helped us before. So hopefully we'll see some results from that. Uh, the, uh, the date, save the date. It is at this year as every year on July 4th. It's a Sunday this year and it'll be going from 1030 to one. So we're shortening it up just a little bit because the kids seem to be getting pretty tired. Um, registration for the parade starts at 1030. Uh, Jay uh, got an email from uh, Bob that he thinks it's going to take about an hour to get everyone registered. So we probably need to shift the parade start to 11.30 from 11.15. Um, I think we're gonna need extra shades. The club has two sets of shades. I have one, but uh, if it's a hot day, we'll wanna have more shade than that. So we're definitely gonna need to get uh, some of those. So if you've got those, appreciate letting me know. Um, We'll also need people to sign up to distribute flyers. So if you could, in the comments, let me know whether you would be able to say adopt a block or a shopping mall for getting flyers into the windows of stores in town. Uh, it's critical that we get those up. That'll be happening uh, mid month. So wanna try to get those up for about three weeks uh, in, in the stores promoting this event. Um, Let's see, any questions going on? Obviously this is gonna be an all hands on deck event. So we'll need everyone to jump in and participate, help out. Uh, lots of work to be done in advance um, on these things, but particularly on the day of, uh, we're gonna need uh, everyone we can possibly get our hands on both in the club and probably outside the club to sign up to take on uh, activities, make hot dogs, snow cones, run kids races, manage the parade, handle signups, deal with the, uh, the duck uh, races and so forth. Uh, I'll be putting up a link so that you can just go in, see which time slots are available and sign up for them. Uh, so you can you know, sign up for more than one thing or jump on whatever you're able to contribute to. coming up it is coming up very soon uh, we are still not in fact uh, in possession of official permission to do this yet because we haven't seen the exact wording on the state's opening up policy which will take place uh, June 15th uh, it looks like it will basically remove all the rules but it's not totally clear on how that works with unticketed large events uh, the city doesn't know <laughs> for like music on the square either, but um, we're, we're acting as though that's the direction we're going to go. But we're not spending any money yet. Well, we're starting to spend a little bit of money, <laughs> hopefully on non-perishables at the very least, right? We do have two bands. We have the, uh, the Hillsburg Community Band, and they were very excited to have this opportunity to get tuned up and, and have their first official live performance. And then following them, and they're only gonna do two 20 minute sets because they are a little rusty. 
And um, the other band is called Court and Disaster. And one of its members is Jim Demartini from Cloverdale Rotary Club. And it's made up of a bunch of lawyers and judges. So um, hence the name Court, Court and Disaster. And they're a lively group. So the, the, it should be really fun. The community band rehearsed last night. We have 12 marches that we're going to be playing for the event. Excellent. Uh, Paul Diaz uh, offered us his, his warehouse as a rehearsal hall. <laughs> Acoustics weren't as good as we would like, but it was fun to get back together. See, we're opening opportunities. Our Rotary's uh, theme this year, Rotary opens opportunities, right? Yep, the opportunity to get back and play music together. That's huge. Right, um, okay, any other questions, comments? Please, P-L-E-A-S from Lance. Nope, okay. Well, we will continue uh, marching down this path. So, let's see, we have a couple recognitions here. So let me see if I can do this without Lance yelling at me. <laughs> so I go to share screen advanced, right? Yep. Share sound. Anything else? Computer and audio. Oh, share yeah, sound. computer audio checkbox and the share sound on the advanced tab and then hit share and that should do it. Let's see. That looks like you did it. All right, let me see if I can get this uh, this sound to to happen. All right, any guesses who loves that music? It's, it's gotta be Lee Morton. It just sounds so much like him. No, anyone else have a guess? I'm introducing this person because it is a, an anniversary of theirs today or June 3rd. Any other guesses? Who loves that song? Dan Erickson. How'd you know? <laughs> it's true. It is Dan Erickson. He was singing along with the song. <laughs> well, I was too. Come on, you guys. It is so much fun playing these old clips at, at night when I'm putting this together. I, Richard's wondering what the heck is going on up here, me and Jimmy. Anyway, Dan. Is this a special week for you and, and Mrs. Erickson? You're muted. Dan, unmute. <laughs> He's still in his Hendrix uh, coma here. <laughs> Dan, unmute. <laughs> uh, the mutes. Yeah, so anyway, it's been 54 years since I saw Jimi Hendrix burn his guitar at the Fillmore Auditorium a week after he played at the Monterey Pop Festival. Anyway, uh, Sonia and I are celebrating our uh, 48th wedding anniversary on Thursday. Uh, we're going to go out to dinner in Bodega on um, uh, Friday night, and then... Uh, we went up to Shelter Cove and Ben Bowen a, uh, a month ago. So we celebrated on the road a little bit early. So, 
So in honor of that, 48 is pretty close to 50. I'll round up to 50 and uh, I'll put uh, $50 in the uh, uh, club's foundation for um, uh, the endowment uh, scholarship fund. And since we're very, very close on uh, polio, I'm going to give $50 to uh, uh, Polio Plus to help uh, uh, eradicate that scourge. And that'll be in memory of my wife's uh, mother-in-law who was confined to a wheelchair from her polio experience. Oh. So uh, anyway, that's what it will do to honor this uh, auspicious occasion. We've actually been together for 52 years. Wow. We've been married for 48. So Sonia was not with you at the Hendrix concert. She was not. I didn't know her at that point in time. That came later. Well, thank you, Dan, for your thank generous you. contribution. And congratulations to you and Sonia for being wonderful examples of, a, of committed commitment. Yes. So. All right. So uh, I, I, I do have another um, another guess whose music this is moment. So hang on. We'll see if I can do this. All right. Any guesses? This is another recognition. This recognition actually goes back to May, another anniversary in, on May 6th. Anybody know who, uh, who loves Alabama? Larry Orr. No. But the, but the name does begin with an L. <laughs> Lee Morton. Yeah, Lee. <laughs> hey, Lee, can you unmute yourself? Lee, can you unmute yourself? <laughs> We're going to get this Thanks, figured Sam. out. Okay. At, at that point, I was in the hospital and really could have cared less and thought that, you know, maybe I'd escaped the whole thing at that point. And, you know, no thanks to you, I guess I didn't. So <laughs> thank you. How, I don't have a clue. I didn't have a clue then about how many years or whatever. Diane can't remember exactly because the only reason I say that is because Every time she brings it up, it varies from here to here to over here, you know, so, but she's getting older, so it's harder for her, I think, to remember stuff like that. Anyway. Um, she's getting older. You're not, right? Yeah, she's, a, she's asleep, so I can say whatever I want at this point. <laughs> um, why don't I, why don't I, <clears throat> I'll give 50 bucks to Polio Plus. That probably is a good place. Thank you, appreciate it. Well, we're glad to see you back from your, your surgery. And, and um, I was really excited that you showed up because I've had this song queued up every week for, <laughs> for a month. <laughs> Thanks, Nance. Lee, this meeting is being recorded and your wife will hear it. Uh-oh. Yeah, we could hold, we could uh, definitely bribe you. So, um, I mean, um, Extort, that's the word. It's not well, beneficial to all concerned. <laughs> right. But is it the truth? That, that, does it pass the truth test? 
Okay, good. Well, Lee, thank you. And, and we're glad to see you back. Um, I think I have time for one more musical guessing game. All right, so hang on, everybody. I hope you're, you're bearing with me on this one. This one's a little different than what we've been listening to. Got to skip ads here. Okay. As we fade away. All right, any guesses? Who loves Beethoven's Fifth? I'm going to guess Bob Mosby. No, I don't have Bob Mosby's musical preferences. Bob, you better send me somebody. Any other guesses? Uh, Doug Pyle. Yes, good job, Jack. Jack, you're really good at this. This this is a uh, a memorable piece of uh, very soaring melodies, a very majestic, and my fondest memories of it are after the earthquake in Guatemala back in '72, I believe it was. Clyde Wellock, one of the doctors here in town, and I flew down for medical assistance. And when we were coming back, we had this on the, the tape player as we were flying over the Sierra Madre, perfectly blue skies, no turbulence, clouds all around. And we were just soaring through these mountains. And it's just, it just sends chills through my spine to think of the total majestic feeling that you had being up there, seeing all of this, and just enjoying it. That's lovely. You know, it's it's not just getting to hear the, the music at the meetings, it's hearing why these songs are so important to us. Yeah. I appreciate that, Doug, thank you. I guess for having good musical taste, no, no comments or inflections on anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> Can you play this on your... On your, what do you play the um, clar clarinet, clarinet? I could probably play parts of it. Yeah, I'll, I will put $25 towards uh, uh, my Paul Harris uh, Rotary Foundation. Oh, that's sweet. Thank you. You didn't have to do that, but um, we, we appreciate it. Well, so much for our musical uh, Ventures today. I do have more queued up for our upcoming weeks. And I see that we have our esteemed superintendent, Chris Vandenhuvel, who is logged on and he is our guest speaker today. And before I um, turn it over to Chris, I wanted to introduce him appropriately. So this is Chris's sixth year as superintendent of the Hillsburg Unified School District. He previously served as the Hillsburg High School principal. I think you followed, did you follow Chris Halloran? John Curry was actually the principal oh, before me. Yeah. Yes, we've had a lot of principals. <laughs> I think my kids ran them off. So, but you have had done a great job. Chris lives here in Hillsburg with his wife and three children. We've met his lovely daughter, Grace, who I believe was the recipient of uh, is it the Drew Esquivel Scholarship. She was, Andy? yes, thank you. And then uh, Jack, who is also a recipient of Drew Esquivel, is that correct? I think he got the Jack Valerga. Oh, right. Okay, good. Thank you. So two out of three of his children have been um, scholarship recipients from our club at least. I'm sure others were in there as well. He has a, a son who is also a sophomore at Hillsburg High School. And we recently um, in the Tribune or at the PD saw 
was it Jack running, uh, finishing a race? Most likely Jack. Yeah. He's the runner. Strongly. It was a great shot of him just barreling through the finish there. Um, so I think I will go ahead and turn this over to you, Chris, as our guest speaker and it's all yours. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you for having me. And it's a pleasure to be back with you all. Um, I'm going to try to give you kind of an overview of the year and it has been quite a year. So, um, Nancy, if you can just wave me down when I have like five minutes left, so we have enough, uh, time for questions. Um, I can get going and just keep talking. So I'd appreciate that. Um, so let me share my screen. Hey, Chris, while you're doing that, I, I, there is one thing I wanted to bring up to the members. Um, so just jump in, interrupt me when you. Okay. Sorry about that. Yeah. That's, that's okay. Uh, I just wanted to let everybody know that the, we had of the 29 members of our club who we surveyed about meeting in person, 97% have responded as having been vaccinated. Oh, there we go. Chris is on. I will take it away, Chris. 95% of your club members are vaccinated. That's fantastic. Yeah, 97. In order for us to get back to Taman Park, they want 100% vaccination. I mean, I think we're all vaccinated, but I've heard back yeah. from 97%. Gotcha. Anyway, go ahead. Okay, so um, a few things. I'm, oh, geez. Now this, maybe this will work now. Okay, good. All right, so I'm not going to read you this, but I'm going to, these are highlights of the um, presentation I'm going to give. Um, like I said, a lot of good things happening in the district, a lot of challenging things happening in the district. It has been a year unlike any other. I'm going to try and not use the word unprecedented. So, um, because it is just frankly overused, but it really does capture what we've all been through. Um, so good news, really good news first. Last, uh, we, we record data. It's kind of a, a little bit slow and a lag, but in, in the, in the class of 2020, so the last graduating class are of course, 21, we're not done yet. So we don't know what the number would be. Um, we had a wonderful statistic here. 57% of our grads at Hillsburg High School completed A to G, an A to G course of study. A to G is the course of study required for an entrance into a UC and most of your higher end private colleges. Um, it is rigorous. And um, the, the vast majority of public high schools in the state would fall somewhere around uh, 30 to 40%. Um, completion rate. And we have been whittling away at this for some time and are really proud to, to say that we hit 57% last year of our grads were um, able to meet that requirement. Uh, I haven't compared it yet to high schools in the county. That data hasn't been released publicly, but we imagine that we will be in the top two, if not the top high school in Sonoma County in terms of the number of graduates um, meeting A to G. So really excited about that. And that's a, a testament, not only to the work they're doing at the high school, but the entire district. It really takes K-12 to get kids prepared um, to meet this, this requirement. So um, it is a great litmus of how we're doing as a district. Um, Marcy Becerra Academy. So we actually adopted new curriculum and a whole new instructional approach this year through a, a um, consultant called Big Picture Learning. And big picture really works to personalize um, personalize students course of study in both alternative and continuation high schools. And so Marcy Becerra, of course, is our continuation schools for kids who didn't, they weren't successful in the regular mainstream high school, um, but they, but we want them to graduate, they wanna graduate. And we're able to put them in this really wonderful program, which A, is focused on personalizing based on their interests and B, um, takes those interests and gives them real world, real world learning opportunities. So we set them up in internships and in their internships, we're able to give them credits for things like English or Spanish if they're doing something in the Spanish language. And so we basically are able to give academic credits through the real world experiences that they're having. Um, so we're in our first year of really diving deep into this. We have a brand new teacher named Tor Top who came from uh, Sun Valley, Idaho, and is versed in big picture, is doing a fantastic job building a community 
um, there at Marcy Becerra. So I'm really excited what's happening there um, and, and a way to serve the students who have struggled uh, at the high school in a much better and more relevant way. Construction has continued. That, honestly, if there is one positive in the pandemic for the schools, it's been that we can, we can build things faster because there's no kids on campus uh, for much of the year. So we were able to finish our uh, renovation, or this is actually the high school gym. So our completely new high school gym, which is gorgeous. Um, it is our second gym. It'll serve as a second gym for, uh, for tournaments. Um, we could have two games going at once. Uh, this year, because we, of course, had the main gym used as a vaccine site for the city, um, this is where we were able to host our athletic contest. Um, and it was really nice because it sat vacant for a couple months um, before we could get kids back on campus. So it's wonderful to use it. The girls' locker room has been constructed uh, next to it and adjacent to the main gym. So we have a centralized athletic complex now. Um, if you recall, Frost Hall was sort of a monument to why we need Title IX, um, a gym that was not usable and the girls' locker room was housed over there. Um, really was not a great space for basketball, volleyball. It does, it does serve for certain things like wrestling, which is where wrestling has been the last few years. So, um, but we're really excited to have the new gym constructed. Uh, HUSD, this one is kind of bittersweet. So we, we were able to move quickly and redo our fields. Our fields were in a state of disrepair, really poor drainage, um, needed some turf repair, some work on the diamonds. We put in scoreboards for the baseball and the softball fields, really made some upgrades on the softball fields, specifically built some dugouts, et cetera. Um, the, <laughs> I say it's bittersweet, the fields are gorgeous. But as we all know, we are, um, we're in the middle of a drought that'll probably be one of the worst droughts any of us have lived through, including the one in the 70s. And we have brand new turf that sucks water up right away. So it is going to be an interesting summer to see if we can protect our investment and still have opportunities for kids to be able to, uh, to, be able to participate in athletics uh, and the community. The, those fields are used in the summer for everything from adult softball to little league. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see what we can do there. And, and we did just spend just over a million dollars renovating them. So we want to protect the investment as much as possible. The, ju the junior high gym building got a wonderful renovation, brand new floor upgrades there. This was actually the, if you recall, five, six years ago, we had an issue with a scare with lead in the water. Um, in the schools. And this was actually the only site that actually had a lead in the water issue that was ongoing. So we've for years had filters on the water system there. Um, so now with this renovation, we were able to redo all the pipes um, and plumbing so that we have no more issues. Uh, the, the building looks wonderful. You can see there that they um, we're able to kind of highlight the architectural features as it was built in the 20s. Um, we uncovered some windows that had been covered up in the gym. So there's a lot of natural light and redid both the boys and the girls locker room there, as well as uh, constructed a new STEM room where we can do our robotics class that builds the car, uh, the electric car every year that has a big roll up door so the car can go in and out. Um, and then finally redid the band room, which is beautiful, has more acoustic touches and some great locker space for instruments um, and is just much more inviting space. So really excited about the junior high we were able to complete. And there you have a picture of the STEM classroom and the band room. I want to highlight a few key community partnerships. Um, we partnered with the Hillsburg Ed Foundation and Corazon Hillsburg to bring in a group called Acosta Educational Partnership. Acosta is a group that leads um, kind of self-examination and pedagogy and instruction around ethnic studies. So there's a professor from uh, the University of Arizona, who uh, Curtis Acosta, who um, who has founded this organization. They've been working with us all year. So we've had a, an institute, a voluntary institute for teachers that started in January to take a look at ethnic studies. And when I say ethnic studies, we're not just talking about making a class at the high school that would be a graduation requirement, um, which would be a good thing. That's not a bad thing, but it's really about applying a different lens to the curriculum and our approach that has diverse points of view, TK-12. 
Um, we're really trying to do a wholesale overhaul of how we approach education to make sure that it's more representative and that we're representing um, other groups besides what traditionally has happened in our schools. So we're taking a, 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 some time to self-reflect and, and make some changes. Um, this is going to be a two or three year process. You can see here we had board workshops. Um, and one of the exciting things is we did um, create a draft board policy for equity and anti-racism, which we hopefully will be adopting either in late June or August of next year. Um, so that was one of the outcomes with Acosta. Um, and this is totally being paid for um, through fundraised monies from the head, the, uh, from HEF and, and Corazon. So we are all very proud of the partnership that we had with the city and the Boys and Girls Club to allow for kids to be in a daycare program that was dovetailed with our educational approach on the Chromebooks uh, through Zoom and Google Classroom uh, so that families could go back to work when they were able to. So we had uh, just over 120 students in both these programs um, that allowed families to be able to work. It was huge. Um, and it allowed our kids to have someone there with them when they were supposed to be in class and to troubleshoot with them when they had technology issues. We did have a handful of students during distance learning who live in remote places, um, whether it's deep Alexander Valley or Dry Creek, where they had problems with internet connections. And so we were able to give them free spots in these programs where they could go for the day and have an internet connection, lunch, and an adult there to help them through. So Really excited to be able to offer that. And not a lot of districts were able to do this uh, on the scale that we did. So it was a, an undertaking and grateful for to the city and the Boys and Girls Club for the partnership. Food service was a highlight of this year. Um, when the pandemic hit last March, honestly, <laughs> when I talk about the year, our, this school year really starts last March um, in, in our heads and experience. There wasn't a lot of summer for us. The pandemic hit and our food service people stepped up and we immediately began serving the community to make sure there was food security for families. So we started delivering to some of the apartment complexes in town. So families didn't have to leave. They could just walk down to the community center at their apartment complex and pick up some food. Um, and, you know, at the height of it, we were delivering 800 meals or so a day. Um, we continue to do grab and go meals for anybody who wants it, who's a child. Um, they don't have to be a student here. So people do come to our campuses right now just to pick up lunch every day. And when they pick it up, they have a breakfast for the next day as well. So we're giving them two meals at a time. Um, and we anticipate this continuing through the summer. Um, and then we'll reassess when we get to August and see where things are. But this has been a highlight and something that I'm very proud of our team for doing. Um, serving our community to make sure nobody's going hungry. I want to highlight if, you, and I'm sure you guys all have some sense of this because we all watch the news and we see the ever changing world of COVID politics, but it has been a nightmare, frankly, to navigate the ever changing guidance and, and frequent frequently contradicting guidance. You know, the CDC says this, then California says this, then Sonoma County Public Health says this. And when it comes to schools, it's it's worse when you get into the details than just the normal stuff. Um, so I'm not gonna go through all of this, but basically every date there reflects a change in the guidance and what we could and couldn't do. Um, and it was maddening, I will tell you that. The latest is June 15th. June 15th, you know, like from what we read in the news, COVID ends on June 15th in California. I don't know what it really means and, and we're all gonna find out here in a week or so. Um, but we, um, we, we anticipate more guidance coming out from the state, um, but right now we don't have any. <laughs> so um, we are starting summer school a little bit blind, knowing that we're gonna have to pivot and do some things to change up and make sure we have the right plans in place. But uh, for now, we're planning on in-person summer school, three feet apart, masked, uh, um, and then we'll go from there um, with the rest of it. So it has been a wild roller coaster ride when it comes to schools and the rules and everything that we can and can't do. Um, so instruction, I want to highlight how we approached the pandemic. Um, the reality is we have basically built the plane in the air three or four times, uh, built and torn down and rebuilt and, and tore down and rebuilt again, trying to find the best way to approach um, instruction for kids. So our distance learning began 
at spring break last year, um, around March 13th, when the shelter in place was ordered, we had anticipated something like that happening, which was good. So we had about a two, three week ramp up um, with some time allotted to teachers to sort of prepare, obviously not enough time because how can you prepare for something like that? Um, but we did have a heads up and it was fortunate it was around spring break. So there was time to catch your breath and then hit the ground running. Um, our students didn't lose any days of instruction. There were other districts that took two weeks once uh, the pandemic hit to get their stuff together. San Diego, I don't think started till mid April. Um, so we, we were really lucky in that our teachers were able to pivot very quickly and we're grateful for that. Um, we did distance learning for summer school for high school last year it was actually really successful. We had a lot of kids recoup some credits that they needed. Um, and then we continued in distance learning until March 31st. Uh, and then on April 1st, we were able to open for elementary in-person learning and then secondary for April 5th. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. During the distance learning um, portion of the school year, we still had things going on. We had tons of clubs happening at all the schools and kids were doing things virtually. We had drive-through events. You see one there pictured at the high school. Uh, we had drive-through movies. Um, things like the newspaper continued. And so we tried to do our best to continue to meet students' needs as best we could in the environment that we found ourselves in with the restrictions that we found ourselves in. Um, one thing that we also did is, we, you know, you see at the bottom there, we really took an approach where we were committed to making sure that students' lives were not hijacked by the pandemic. We didn't want to change a student's directory or allow them to, you know, involuntarily have their direct their trajectory changed. So an approach that we took, um, there were a lot of students who experienced a lot, a lot of issues. And um, whether it be just grades falling because of Zoom fatigue or anxiety or depression from isolation, but just a, a plethora of things going on. So to make sure kids could graduate, we created individual plans. We have some flexibility in what grad requirements can be. Um, we have actually pretty stringent graduation requirements as compared to what the state requires. And so from the state minimum to what we normally require, we have a, a great de degree of flexibility. So we developed these individual plans where we could waive certain requirements for students who were impacted um, adversely by the pandemic. Uh, we took every individual plan to the Board of Trustees for approval and all of them still would meet the California graduation requirements. So we're, we're trying our best to make sure every kid continues to get through high school despite the challenges that they've lived through. Um, so like I alluded to earlier, April 1st and April 5th, we returned to in-person instruction. We were the first public high school in the county to come back. Uh, very proud of that. I will tell you that the trick was Alliance Health Center. Um, they were awesome. We worked with them to get our clinic set up here at the high school. And uh, during that whole setup, they promised to get our teachers fully vaccinated. We were the first district, I think, to have every teacher have the opportunity. We can't force them to vaccinate, but have the opportunity to be fully vaccinated. And that was what was the difference maker for us coming back. Um, so we were really, really excited. It was just a joyous occasion to have kids back on campus and to see the whites of their eyes in their seats, even though we were all masked and six feet apart. Um, it was wonderful and there wasn't a person here who didn't relish those first few days. Um, so just some highlights from that. You can see we have to temperature screen kids as they come in. Um, you see our grab and go lunches, kids getting off the bus and six feet apart. Um, these are all first day of school pictures from our various campuses. It is an undertaking to bring kids back to school with all the rules and regulations that we have, but I am so proud of the work that our, our teachers, our administrators and our classified staff have done to do so. And to, we've had actually, since we returned to in-person instruction, we've had one positive COVID case that just happened last week. Um, didn't have any spread at all. And it's just, it just is a testament to the, the work and the dedication that our staff have done. Um, so here you see the junior high, very similar. And then of course the high school, Mr. Lancaster, our art teacher, um, every first day of school, he pulls out the bagpipes and then he uses them at graduation too. He kind of marches the kids in. So he was there with his mask on with a special filter over his bagpipes playing away uh, when the kids came back on campus. I mean, you can see different, there's a small thing here. We have to have a system in the hallways. So kids are, you know, you go one direction on one side and the other down the other. So you can see them taped off with, with arrows, et cetera. 
mental health and social emotional well-being. So this was a really big concern and continues to be for us. Um, kids, particularly in Sonoma County, experienced a great de degree of um, anxiety and depression coming out, com you know, throughout the pandemic and coming, coming out of it. Um, I'm going to talk more about that, but what we're doing about it, we have social emotional learning time during the day. Um, so different approaches there. Um, we have a group of counseling interns who, who have really worked hard to do outreach and support students and staff. Um, and then Currently, we have, uh, you see the, the psychologists and secondary counselors, et cetera. We, those are our counseling services. We're going to be expanding them for next year. So we're hiring an additional two mental health counselors. So they're either, either licensed social workers or, um, or MFTs, family therapists. So we're trying to get some very highly trained um, folks who can do some psychological triage with our kids and make sure that they're in a good place um, moving forward. Um, this is what I wanted to highlight about Sonoma County. So we did, there's a, there's a survey that we do that we just started actually. <laughs> Our first time giving it was the, was last March. So right after the pandemic hit and consistently high schoolers and middle schoolers in Sonoma County have identified their biggest obstacle to learning throughout this feeling depressed, stressed, or anxious. Um, and it, what it doesn't say here is about their future. Um, they, they identify being depressed, stressed, or anxious about their future as their number one obstacle to learning, um, followed by distractions at home. Statewide and nationally, distractions at home is the number one survey response for kids. Um, and what we are beginning to see is that students living through the psychological traumas that they have over the last four years, fire after fire, throw in a flood, um, and then the COVID pandemic, there is not a year that has passed. So for instance, Jack, my son, who you talked about earlier, he, every year there has been what seemingly could be a life-threatening event that's happened basically at home. Um, and so the kids are stressed and anxious. They're, they're feeling that. Um, and that's why we're really committed to having things in place to be able to get them in a healthier spot once we have them all back at school together. Um, so that is something we continue and it's not just us it's the entire county we're really concerned about with our kids you know and we're hoping we can get a respite from the fires here um, now of course we're going to be dealing with the drought so it's going to be an interesting few months but um, our kids are hurting as a result um, you think back you know I was a kid I grew up in Santa Rosa the only thing that happened even remotely close to that was the 89 Loma Prieta earthquake when I was in high school um, otherwise I didn't live through anything like that. So it's kind of astounding to think about what they've encountered and, you know, the seniors this year, especially and throughout their high school career. Um, and then finally, I have, I'm really pleased to announce that we have a new principal coming in at the high school. Her name is Amy Jones Kerr. Um, you may have heard of her from Roseland. So she actually founded Roseland University Prep and Roseland Collegiate Prep, which are two nationally renowned high schools for, um, working with primarily Latino low-income students and getting them prepared for college. They have an amazing college going rate um, and she's done a fantastic job building these schools. She's, she's been in Roseland for 23 years, uh, is bilingual, was the district superintendent. Um, she had, you know, this happens with superintendents. The average, I shouldn't say this out loud. The, uh, the average superintendent term right now in the state is eight months because of the political nature of our jobs, right? And so there's, there's a, there can be falling outs with your, um, with your board politically on a personal disagreement or with the community or whatnot. Um, and, and Amy had just a time with her board that became very difficult and she decided to step back and really wants to get back to high school because that's what she does well in working with the kids. So we were just tickled to be able to get her to come to Hillsburg High. She's gonna do a fantastic job I will just address that there is an article in the Tribune this week coming out. There, there, when Amy left, there were some concerns raised at the same time, completely coincidental, not about her, but about Roseland um, and things going on there. And um, unfortunately, because she departed over some political things that were different with her board, um, 
some of that has somehow gotten married in the minds of people. And so um, to basically make sure that we address any concerns that are out in the community, we're quote, investigating. I don't know that we're gonna find anything because Rosen's already done an investigation on the allegations that were made about their district. And their A, they were there were no allegations about Amy and B, they didn't have any findings in their investigation. Um, just a lot of banter on Facebook is what's going around. But we do have parents who read about it and they're very concerned. So we're gonna address it. Um, but I am confident that there is no issue with Amy and, and I'm really, really excited to have her and can't wait to introduce her to you guys maybe next year and, and have you learn more about her and work alongside her. So really excited to have her as an addition at the high school. And then we also were able to hire a new assistant principal. His name is Francisco Manriquez. Um, he comes from Sonoma Valley, was a vice principal there. Uh, going to do a fantastic job is, is he immigrated to Mexico from Mexico, uh, as a, as a young youngster around four years old, um, did a stint at Cardinal Newman as their Dean of students and their wrestling coach. Um, Andy will be happy to hear that. And, um, actually won a duels championship for NCS as the wrestling coach there. And, um, is going to do a fantastic job, native speaker, um, great Latino role model for our students. So we're excited to have him and Amy come on, um, two bilingual administrators and, and be able to continue the good work that, uh, Bill Halliday and his team have done at the high school. And of course, Bill is retiring. Um, so we're, you know, we're sad to lose him, but good for him. And, uh, really grateful for what he's done for the community. He actually started as a part-time interim elementary principal with our kids then became their junior high principal and this class is going to graduate with them into his retirement so he it's almost a waldorf approach that he's taken coming up with the kids so that's been a great experience and, and he's been wonderful to the community and our children so and with that i'm done do you guys have any questions for me take down the um i would just jump in if you have questions chris you are like seem like the right guy for this job my god what you have done this year this would be a monumental a ta task in a normal year so this is quite amazing so i have a question yeah uh my son who is a uh, a hound grad was commenting the other day it seems like the high school is under perpetual construction. Is it ever gonna be finished and uh, uh, not have construction activity going on on that campus? We are very close. So we of course passed a bond my first year as superintendent, um, which doing the math, what's that 2014, 15? Um, and when you do a bond, you have this large amount of money that you have to spend in a certain amount of time. So construction happens. The bond was focused on the high school and the junior high. Um, we are currently at the high school doing the conditioning room. Um, so it's the pri it was the girls' locker room. It's being remodeled to be a conditioning room. So um, a, a place for PE classes and athletes to work out, um, both weights and um, cardio. And that will be done this summer. And then the last thing is some sort of performing arts space that we're still conceptualizing. So I don't have a date on that, but probably, you know, we have to submit plans to the Department of State Architecture. That takes about a year and then another probably six to eight months of construction. So we're a good probably two, two and a half years out from construction being totally done at the high school. Hey, Chris, I have a question for you. Yeah. Uh, hello, by the way, long time no see. I know. The um, we, we normally have the, the Drew Escobar in camp um, on campus in the summertime. Um, this year we moved it to July just to try to you know give us a little bit more breathing room to make sure everything was going to be good. But uh, you see any restrictions for use of campus facilities over the summer? Uh, the conditioning room might be a, a, an issue. You know, so frost might not be the best, but we might be, I mean, we have two gyms too now, right, right there. So we can put you in one of those gyms. And then the, I, I actually, I thought it was super cool. So the, for those of you that don't know, we had full sports happen. I should have put that in the presentation. High school sports began in February, late February, and then just ended last week. My son, um, Sam, who's a sophomore, played basketball and baseball at the same time. So we had, we had weeks where he had eight games. We'd literally... <laughs> play a baseball game and leave in the sixth inning to get him to the basketball game on time or vice versa. 
And so wrestling happened too, which nobody could believe that it was allowed in COVID. Um, we had no issues, right? No, no cases popped up. And one of the cool things I thought was we had outdoor wrestling matches. So we have a really nice artificial turf space uh, on campus now between our new gyms and they set up the mats there and it was just a cool venue to do a, a, you know, a different thing. So I'm kind of hoping that lives on Andy. That might be a, an approach to take too. I don't know. We're hearing from public health and both pub, the state and Sonoma County that there are going to be parameters post June 15th, despite what the governor says. Um, so we're, I, I don't have a good answer for you other than there's going to be something, but I'm assuming it's going to be okay because we were able to do it this year. So it's just a, it's just a matter of us waiting and getting the guidance and then working together to make it happen. So I, I don't see an issue with having it occur. I just don't know what it'll look like. If that makes sense. Yeah. I have a couple uh, comments. Uh, Chris, just listening to you makes me realize how important it is for uh, us to be communicating with you throughout the year. I mean, just the things that you've done make me makes me wonder what how we could have partnered with you in certain ways. Um, you know, we, we obviously were restricted ourselves because of COVID, but um, you know, hopefully, as we move back to a normal life, we can stay in touch and see how we and maybe the Noon Club can can support these efforts because th th it's really quite exciting what you're doing. Um, I also, it, one of the things I wanted to do in my presidency that obviously didn't happen was to have on-site meetings at locations in, in Hillsburg. And God, I, you know, if Larry Mills, our incoming president is up for this, it'd be wonderful to have a meeting at the school when the, the time is right, you know, that, that works within your schedule to, so we could see all of the, the amazing things that have been completed. Yeah, no, that would be fantastic. I, we love showing off the schools. So um, we definitely can make that happen and completely uh, agree with the partnership. You guys have been great partners throughout the years, as has the noon time. I know I'm not supposed to say that, um, but yeah. The, and we're, we're all together. <laughs> we love each other. <laughs> even Kiwanis has been good too. Um, but the uh, we we would love to continue to partner with you. And this year, of course, has been so hard, you know. And here we are, all looking at each other on the screen still. Hopefully, we can we can all be back together soon. But yeah, agreed. And um, let's let's not lose track of that. My only sad thing about the uh, remodeling of the gyms is my daughter's initials are now off the the stands when her class painted them, they, they painted the, the, the stand. I can always go in, you know, she's been out of school almost 20 years, but her little oh. initials were always on that, on those the bleachers and they're gone now, but that's okay. Anybody else have any questions or comments for Chris? Um, oh, Jay. Chris, uh, our club's been closely uh, associated with Marcy Bracera. Um, can, is there something that we can do? We brought in speakers and that kind of stuff. Yeah. I mean, have you met Tor Top yet? I don't know who the liaison is. He's, he's a remarkable guy and has done a fantastic job with them. Like, he, let me give you just like a little anecdote about how Marcy has changed. So when I got to Healdsburg high 11 years ago, um, <laughs> Marcy Becerra was almost I hate to say it this way, but it, it felt like juvenile hall on campus. Yes. Students were not allowed to come on the high school campus. Uh, they were confined at lunch. And I use the word confined because it's really true. They had like this little concrete pad with a picnic table. Lunch was delivered to them. There were no food options. They got what was delivered. Um, kind of treated as second class citizens. So that was one of the first things my team and I took on was like, how do we get them integrated back on? And honestly, like to, some of the staff treated them that way, right, in general. So we have done a lot of work to get them back integrated into the mainstream. Um, yes, we still have a, a program, but it's housed right next to all our other programs in the high school. You would never know when you look at a kid on campus, they're a Marcy student. Um, and then they have access to sports. They can, they can participate. They can, they go to lunch with the rest of, of the high school. 
Um, and add, they, they all take at least one CTE class, one of the um, kind of uh, hands-on voc vocational classes on campus as well. This, and one of the things we did was, we, we always have been cognizant in graduation to have the Marcy graduation with the high school. They're all mixed in, right? Because it's a different diploma. It says Marcy Becerra, not Healdsburg High. This year, the students petitioned us to have their own graduation ceremony because they have built such a great community and they want to celebrate with their community, their accomplishments, which is yeah. such a, an about face, right? Like we fought so hard to not have separation. And now they're asking just for a little distinction, but not because they want to be separate because they're proud of who they are and what they've done. Um, so it's really a, a cool change <laughs> over the last decade and a testament to not only big picture learning, but Tor Top, the teacher there, who's done a really good job building community. So it'd be awesome to get you guys involved with them. I mean, I'm sure he would have ideas of how you could support him. Okay. Yeah. Right. Years ago, I know we did, um, we went in and talked about careers with, with the students. And uh, anyway, so that was really fun. Anybody else have any questions for Chris? I, I know I've let the meeting go over, but you're too uh, interesting and uh, relevant to our community to just cut you off. <laughs> so... Well, I'm happy to come back anytime. It's good to see you all again. And hopefully next time we can, we can be at Taman. Yeah. Okay. Or, or at the high school. Yeah. Or at the high school, either way. So, so just to say thank you, we will be making a donation in your name to uh, Polio Plus oh, for um, being right. our guest speaker today. And we really appreciate it. And look forward to seeing more of your your students your your children in the paper your son who sam what's your youngest name yeah sam 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 yeah okay i didn't have his name grace jack and sam that's it wonderful well thank you so much chris all right thank you we it's will, great to see you all we look forward to hearing more all right thank um you. I, I just next week June 9th, our guest speaker is Jeff Kay, who is the city, the manager of the city of Healdsburg. So that should also be another look into what's going on in our community. And if nothing else, I will um, get everybody more information on the survey that we um, took about meeting in person. We are targeting June 23rd at Taman. So be there or be square. It should be uh, really great to see everybody in person again. So any other questions, comments? Hearing none, we will close our meeting. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Wow.